So our next speaker is uh, Ryan Brill. He's a fourth year doctoral student in applied math at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he loves Indian and Thai food and is a Lakers fan, which uh, we don't usually admit in Boston, but, uh, but we'll, uh, we're glad to have him here. So. Thank you. Hello. This is going to be a fun one. So the basis of in-game strategic decision making in math is a value function. And you might want to make the decision which maximizes the value of the next game state. In football, these value functions tend to be win probability or expected points. So expected points says, given your game state, what's the expected value of the points of the next score in the half? And you might want to, for example, make the fourth down decision which maximizes win probability. But expected points and win probability are not observable quantities or accounting statistics. They arise from models. And there are two types of models broadly from which they arise. The first is probabilistic state space models. So you have to manually specify all of the game states, all of the actions you can take from a game state, and those transition probabilities. And it's quite hard to manually specify all of those things in such a complicated game like football and to do it correctly. But to those of you who do work on these models, keep doing it. They're wonderful and it's not the subject of today's talk. The other option is a statistical model. Uh, so these are data-driven regression or machine learning approaches where you fit the model from a historical data set of x and y variables. And these, these models are widely used today for several reasons. Um, there's rich publicly available data. It's easy to go into R and fit an XGBoost, and they're powerful, so people use them. And we have discovered some problems. I don't want to say discovered, but there are problems with these models, and we're going to talk about some of those today. So let's start with expected points models. Here is a brief history of some well-known public expected points models going all the way back to Romer and Brian, um, where the outcome of these expected points models back in the day was just the points of the next score, a real number like seven for a touchdown, or three for a field goal. And the game state variables, or the X uh, features, just in the beginning was just yard line. But more recent models from Ron and friends, and from Baldwin, will use a larger game state, more features, so as a function of yard line, down, time remaining, yards to go. Can we predict the outcome of the next score, like What's the probability that the next score is a touchdown? What's the probability the next score is a field goal, et cetera? And then you can define the expected points of the next score as the weighted sum, seven times probability of a touchdown plus three times probability of field goal, et cetera. OK, but if you notice in that column of features, these models do not adjust for team quality. So they're functions of yard line, down, yards to go, time remaining, timeouts, all these things, but not team quality. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, you already have a lot of features, and now you want to throw in all these team quality features. Uh, that's a lot. It's a lot of features. It's nonlinear. It's interacting. It's really hard. It's very hard to do. You can overfit. Uh, but also, it's justified by saying that these models represent expected points for an average offense facing an average defense, and so imply decision making for average teams. And there's a quote from the Romer paper that says this exact thing. Um, but let's do a little thought experiment. So, crowd, I'm going to ask you, what is the probability that an average NFL kicker sinks a 70-yard field goal? Does anyone have an answer? 
Zero. I like that answer. <laughs> yes, if you're an average kicker, this is probably too far for you. But what's the probability that Justin Tucker sinks a 70-yard field goal? The GOAT. 1%. A 15, a 1, I don't know, I don't know what it is, maybe 1, it's, whatever it is, it's a positive number, okay? What's the probability that a randomly drawn kicker sinks a 70-yard field goal? Well, if you randomly draw a kicker, you could randomly draw Justin Tucker, but you could randomly draw an average kicker, so whatever it is, it's also a positive number. So what this goes to show you is that there's a difference between an average something and a randomly drawn something, right? So Back to the problem, expected points models don't adjust for team quality. This causes problems for several reasons. First of all, these metrics are reporting expected points for randomly drawn teams, not for average teams. There's no such thing as a, the Eagles to the Patriots are not a randomly drawn team. You are a team with a team quality. There's no such thing as a decision made by a random team. And secondly, there's a huge selection bias problem, which I've summarized in these two plots. So the blue plot, shows us that good teams have more plays. So good teams, so, so conditional on being near the red zone, which is the yard line being in zero to 30, right? Conditional on that, if you're a good team, a large negative point spread, which is the left bar, you're more likely to be a good team with a large negative point spread than you are to be a bad team with a large positive point spread. So the blue figure says good teams have more plays, the red figure says that good teams score more points. So again, conditional on being near the red zone. Um, good teams, the average empirical points of the next score is about four and a half. That's the leftmost red bar. And if you're a bad team, large positive point spread, your average empirical points of the next score is three and a half, the rightmost red bar. So good teams score more points, good teams have more plays, but you're not adjusting for team quality, so your randomly drawn whatever expected points thing is too large. It's an overestimate, it's biased. Okay, so we want to adjust for team quality. Hopefully I've convinced you of this. Let's do another thought experiment. This is a little bit of an aside, but I thought it was fun. So I created eight aspects of team quality. They're all on the same scale. They're all built from play success, and there's no data bleed here. And then I just threw these into an expected points model and um, it was interesting. So I want you guys to rank these eight in terms of predictive performance. Like what is the most important? What's the second most important? So I can read some of them off for you. Offensive teams, quarterback quality. Offensive teams, non-quarterback, offensive quality. Defensive teams, defensive quality against the pass. Defensive teams, defensive quality against the run. Offensive teams, defensive quality against the pass. Offensive teams, defensive quality against the run. Defensive teams, quarterback quality. Defensive teams, non-quarterback, offensive quality. Do we have any guesses? What is the most important or most predictive of these eight? A. A, offensive teams, quarterback quality. Yes, obvious. What about the second most important? G, defensive teams, quarterback quality. Yeah, you guys are so good at this. Um, someone more, less of a football fan might have thought, okay, if you have the ball, and you're on offense with your quarterback, obviously that matters a lot, but you're playing against their defense, so maybe you would have thought that their defense's quality will matter more in predicting the expected points, but it turned out that the second most important was the defensive team's quarterback, because if you turn it over, then their quarterback has the ball, and that's very predictive. So I thought that was interesting. And then the other two offensive quality, so your team's remaining offensive quality and their team's offensive quality, were the third and fourth most important metrics, and the defensive metrics basically were very close to zero and didn't matter. So I thought that was fascinating. Uh, but that's a bit of an aside, because what's the real problem here is we want to adjust for team quality in our expected points models, but we have way too many variables uh, to make this easy. So we have team quality, yard line, down, yards to go, time, and team quality, there's, they're, they're nonlinear, they're interacting. Wow, we, we have to fit a big machine learning model but we don't want to overfit, right? So we can recast this in terms of the bias variance trade-off. We want to use machine learning to capture, uh, we want to be flexible and capture a complex relationship. So we want low bias, but that can have high variance. These models, especially on play-by-play -play data, can overfit, and I have evidence of this later. 
Um, but how do statisticians typically deal with overfitting? Well, regularization, maybe shrinkage. Um, and these things are, they've been studied in, for parametric models really well. You can use Bayesian models, and that's great. But if we're using XGBoost, if we're doing tree machine learning, that can be really hard. And Brian, just on Tuesday, said this, and I thought it was perfect. Um, congratulations to you if you can figure out how to be Bayesian for these in-game machine learning models, because most publicly available models are just their XG boost, and that's the best we got. Um, OK, but we were inspired by uh, Samuel Ku, who's a Harvard stat professor, uh, wrote about this thing called the catalytic prior, and we were able to adapt it to smooth out the tree machine learning models and reduce the overfitting. And the idea behind this is very simple and also very cool. So uh, maybe on a high level, right, you, you think you have an XGBoost model, you have a crazy machine learning model, whatever, and you want a prior for it. The idea is your prior can just be a model and it can just be a simpler model. So for example, Yurko's multinomial logistic regression is a higher bias, lower variance model. So why not just use that as a prior? So how does that work? You take your observed real data, your real football plays, play-by-play -play data set, and then you can fit a simpler model, like a multinomial logistic regression, and then we can take, we can make a new X matrix of other game states, and we can fill out a Y column for that new X matrix by just using the predictions from the simpler model, which generates the synthetic data set and that synthetic data or imputed data will act as our prior, and we're gonna combine the real data of actual football plays with the fake data coming from the simple model, and then you can fit your XG boost on the combined data, and that will smooth out your XG boost, and boy, does it smooth it out. So, uh, very cool stuff. We can summarize this by a predictive performance comparison of all these different expected points models. So the ones at the bottom, uh, from 2009 to 2006, they only had yard line as a feature. So, um, yeah, of course, they're going to perform worse than the two above, which add all these extra features. Um, but the bottom four models did not, none of them adjusted for team quality and expected points. So when you do adjust for team quality, there's a huge jump in predictive performance. One of the most fascinating things about this chart is that Yurko Plus, the best version of multinomial logistic regression that I could find, and don't worry, I was tuning on a third validation set, separate from the test set, do not worry. That is better than Baldwin Plus, the best version of XGBoost classification. So that is evidence of overfitting. You can take the exact same features and throw it in the most flexible model out there, use your cross-validation to tune it, whatever, it still overfits and can't beat a simple linear model. But we know that, for example, at the end of the half, you're gonna have some weird curves and some interactions and nonlinearities, whatever. So you know that you can't just use multinomial logistic regression, so why not combine it into the, and that's what the catalytic XG boost does, and it does beat both of the other ones. And you might think, oh, look, that out of sample ML, uh, mean absolute error is just so slightly better. How can you be here talking about how good this is? But just think about it like this. On a subset of a few plays, the model's much better, but on most plays it's pretty similar. So, okay. That's all fine and dandy, very cool, but at the end of the day, if you want to make fourth down decisions, you don't want to maximize expected points. You don't want to score more points necessarily, you want to win the game. The real um, value function that you're interested in is win probability, right? Um, turns out there's a third prob problem with win probability models, and it's a devious one. So. How do, how do these statistical win probability models work? You take your X matrix, which is all the game states of the entire history, play-by-play -play history of football in the last 15 years, and your Y variable is one if the team with possession wins the game, else zero, and you can put this XY into a machine learning thing, and out pops your win probability model, and people see, wow, my play-by-play -play data set has 500,000 plays. The last 15 years of football, that's a lot of data, so my win probability model must be great, right? Wrong. Because there are not 500,000 independent outcome variables. 
because every game has only one winner. So for a group of 500 plays from the same game, whatever, there's a one or a zero in the response column, but it's the same number one for all those plays. In other words, the data is autocorrelated. So the effective sample size is actually the number of games in the data set, which is about 4,000. This is nowhere near enough data to experience the full variability of the nonlinear and interacting variables stated here. To show you how difficult it is to accurately fit a win probability model using just 4,000 games, we created the dumbest random walk version of football you could think of, which is you have a ball and it moves left or right with some probability, and then it'll hit this end zone, then your team will score a touchdown. And if it hits this end zone, your other team, other team will score a touchdown. Now, because it's a random walk, and we all had to take that probability class for your grad school, we can calculate this win probability exactly. It is known, right? So because we can actually determine the true win probability in this game, we can now use that to evaluate how good our machine learning statistical models are. So we're gonna take this simulation, sorry, we're gonna take this random walk football thing, and we're gonna simulate a fake historical data set of play-by-play uh, play by play data set that looks, it, it mimics exactly the real football data set. There's going to be an autocorrelated win loss response variable. And then we're going to use XGBoost to fit our win probability model to on this data set, and we're going to see how well it does. And this figure shows us, so the dotted lines indicate uh, the estimated win probability as a function of time for a given field position, and the colors are different score differentials. The dotted line are the estimates, and the solid line are the true win probability values, which we know because we're in random walk football land. And we can see that um, actually Boost gets the general trend right. It, 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 it's sort of unbiased, pretty much. Yeah, it, it kind of works. But what about the variance? So we created bootstrapped win probability confidence intervals. We tuned the bootstrap to achieve 90% coverage. And what we see is that in order to achieve this adequate coverage, the win probability confidence intervals need to be really wide. 8% win probability on average. So to per put that in perspective, if your point estimate is 0.64 at a given game state, your confidence interval is gonna look something like 0.6 comma 0.68. Uh, so that's a really fat interval and it's not a lot of granularity, especially for decision making. So this is just in dumb random, random mock football land, and real football is exponentially more complex. Confidence intervals should be even wider. So ultimately, we're not actually interested in the confidence interval and the win probability. We are interested in uncertainty quantification for the fourth down decision itself. So to do that, we created this metric called bootstrap percentage. So let's talk a little bit about our bootstrap confidence intervals for win probability. So let's say you have one historical data set of football plays, right? Now we're gonna bootstrap 100, let's say, different trainings. Uh, we're gonna create 100 bootstrapped data sets and fit a win probability model to each of those. And then now we have 100 win probability models and at each game state, you get an, an estimated optimal decision, go, field goal, or punt, based on let's make the decision which maximizes win probability at that game state. Now, if you have 100 different estimated optimal decisions, they're not necessarily always going to be the same. So a certain percentage of these bootstrap models will say that go is the best decision, a certain percentage will say field goal, and a certain percentage will say punt. And that is the correct way to uh, quantify uncertainty in the decision itself. So I think this chart will nicely summarize how our decision making is gonna work. So we have three options, go, field goal, and punt. And the blue column gives us the point estimate according to our XGBoost whatever win probability model. So if 73.7% .7 is the win probability if you go and 72.2% is the field goal, you have a 1.5% win probability edge by going for it according to the point estimate. But what's the confidence interval on that edge? Given by the bootstrap, you just take the quantiles of the bootstrap and you see that the decision could be as bad as losing 4% or as good as gaining 4%. In other words, it could be the worst or the best decision of your life, and that just, that and the uncertainty lies in the fact that we have a small data set because of the autocorrelation. And we can summarize that win probability gain confidence interval into the orange column bootstrap percentage, which says that about half the bootstrap models say go is better, and half say field goal is better. 
So we really don't know what the best decision is in this scenario. I don't care what your XGBoost says. Okay, so let's look at some example plays. How does fourth down decision making change? So, okay, this is Bears have the ball against the Jets uh, in week 12. Uh, they're down seven, and you're, they're on the four-yard line in the first quarter, and they're massive underdogs. And the point estimate says that a field goal has a 2% win probability edge over go. So a traditional analytics person would recommend a field goal attempt. And you see in this chart right here, so the pink dot lies at the four-yard line and four yards to go. But you could imagine um, perturbing the yard line or the yards to go, and you can see how the decision changes, right? So the pink dot, which is the current location of the play, lies in the yellow region, which means field goal is estimated to be opt uh, optimal, and then the coloring or the shading shows how much that gain in win probability is. So, very cool. Um, but when we account for uncertainty, we add two columns and an extra plot. So let's look at the two columns. The win probability gain confidence interval, it could be as bad as losing 4% or as good as gaining 4%. So we don't really have enough granularity to know if it's the best decision. And similarly, about half the bootstrap models say go is better, half say fuel goal is better. So we don't really know what the best decision is. And you can visualize this decision in the plot on the bottom right, which shows for each combination of yard line and yards to go, keeping all the other game state variables constant, how does the proportion of bootstrapped models making that decision change? So the pink dot at four yard line, yard line four and yards to go four, it's in a white colored region, which corresponds to 50% of a model saying that field goal is better. So as you can see, for most of the combinations of yard line and yard to go here, the colors are very, very light, which indicates high uncertainty at this game state. And I think one reason to understand intuitively why there's so much uncertainty here is it's at the beginning of the game, and win probability is harder to get at the beginning of the game. All right, so here's another example. Uh, commanders have the ball uh, against the Colts. They're up by one. It's fourth down and five, 71 yards from the end zone, middle of the third quarter, slight underdog. The point estimate says that they have a slight edge by punting. So traditional analytics might say, maybe we should lean slightly toward punt, or maybe it's a toss up. And when we add uncertainty, what we see is that the confidence interval is fully positive and nearly all the bootstrap models say punting is better. So this is fascinating. What it's saying is that this small edge of punting is actually consistent across all of our bootstrap models. And that's because when probability of a decision is correlated across different draws of the training set. So even though it's a tiny edge, the edge is there. So we would still recommend you take, you make the punt, but if you don't end up punting, it's actually not a tragedy because you're not losing that much win probability. We can visualize that this decision boundary in the bottom right plot, so that, he, that really fat white zone is a region of uncertainty, but you can notice that most of the other colors are really dark, which means most of the bootstrap models are saying they know what to do. And I think it's darker than the previous one a lot because it's closer to the end of the game. But I'm not entirely sure. Okay, here's a, another interesting example is the Raiders at the Rams last year. Uh, the Ra Raiders were up by six, fourth down and one, 66 yards in the end zone at the very, very end of the game. And the win probability estimate of going for it was something like 3% higher than punting. So yeah, you should probably go for it according to the point estimate. And when we account for uncertainty, all of the bootstrap models say go is better. Confidence interval is entirely positive. You have to go for it here. And it's funny that the Raiders punted and the Rams won after a Mayfield 98-yard game-winning drive. So this is, this is a, I'm a Rams fan, this is great. Um, okay, so in conclusion, we talked about a lot today, but basically, we want to make decisions and in strategic in-game decisions in football using expected points or win probability models, but you have to include team quality in these models. But when you include team quality, it becomes a really hard machine learning problem. It's very easy to overfit. So we need some sort of shrinkage to mitigate the overfitting. That's where we were thinking about the catalytic prior stuff, which helped us. 
But win probability, not expected points, is the value function we really care about. But we, this is where the humility comes in. There, really, there are not enough games to fit an accurate win probability model using a machine learning or statistical method because there's not enough data. So I, you can have the most unbiased model in the world, there's just not enough data. So we need to be humble about the point estimates that come out of these models. And another takeaway is far fewer fourth down decisions are as obvious as the analysts widely claim. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? Thanks. Uh, first thing, that was fantastic talk. Um, my question, though, is I might have missed this, I guess, but the bootstrapping, mm -hmm. what exactly was the structure of that bootstrapping ah, for these models? What was this? I didn't really talk about it, so it's a good question. Um, so think about, okay, what are we doing? Win probability, bootstrapping. So what does the response column here look like? It looks like a one if the team with possession wins the game, zero if not, and these come in clusters of games. Uh, but across games, you can assume independence. But basically, we did something called the randomized cluster bootstrap, which is first you resample games um, with replacement, and then within each game, you resample plays within, uh, with replacement. Yeah. One quick follow-up question. Um, your bootstrap intervals, uh, is this connected to like a conformal interval? Not that I'm aware of, but okay. yeah. Great talk. Um, I'm curious about uh, if you can give me some more details about your team quality uh, model or how you approach that. And I'm thinking like your Baker Mayfield example in the third one, like that helped bring him back from the dead, but he was playing just because Stafford was injured, right? So, Correct. so how do you adjust? Like, how would a team quality model adjust for the fact that it's Baker Mayfield instead of Matthew Stafford? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, in this thing where I was just doing the thought experiment. Um, quarterback quality, you know, we would have put in Bay, uh, Mayfield's quarterback quality. How do we do this? So this was actually, it turns out that these, I spent so much time making these and it was just worse than the point spread because point spread has updated information like injuries. So did I, was it a waste of time? No, because these plots are really cool. But um, <laughs> you could ask, how did I make these? It's kind of interesting because we want to create a team quality metric to put into an expected points model, but many of the times you'll see EPA as a way to measure player quality. So you can't just fit an expected points model without team quality, make an EPA, and then put that thing back in. It just feels like circular logic or data bleed, or I don't even know, something's wrong with it. So I created a version of EPA on holdout data, and then yeah, I created a version of expected points on holdout data, then create an EPA, and then use that to create these team quality things. Uh, but they were way worse than the point spread. So what's going on in this picture with Baker Mayfield is the point spread's minus six and a half, so that's the team quality adjustment here. But obviously you can do better if you spend two years building something better. Yeah. Very humble, thank you. All right, we'll take one, uh, one or two last questions here. I'll come to you in just a second. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about um, the, the selection bias that you talked about, uh, both in terms of the field goal example that you gave with Justin Tucker and with the expected points. So the easier one to understand is the Justin Tucker one. Um, in a football game, you're never just like randomly putting a kicker out uh, to kick a 70 yard field goal. If you're doing that, it's because uh, the coach has made a decision that they think the kicker can make that. And so the conditional probability should be part of the model and similarly, where you have the better teams are usually the ones who are gonna be in the red zone is the, is the bias, but theoretically, a team that has made it into the red zone is probably performing better on that drive, and that's part of the conditional probability that goes into it. So how would you think about kind of just the, the balance of trying to do the pure league average versus the team? Yeah, you're, what you're talking about is within game team quality, and you're suggesting that even if at the beginning of the game you think you're a shittier team and then you made it into the red zone, that somehow if on that day you're a better team than you normally are, and that needs to be accounted for with a measure of in-game, within game team quality, and that's a hard problem on its own, but it's, it's distinct in my eyes. 
I, uh, thanks again for the talk, really interesting perspective. Just um, one thing that came into my mind from an economic point of view is if I'm a coach, you know, game theory problem, I'm not necessarily making a decision to win, I'm making a decision to not get fired. And I'm curious if uh, maybe something you could think about or try to put in like coach's probability of being employed next year, you know, as like a component of this. So it's. It's a little bit, you know, tongue in cheek, but I also think there's a component of that too. So thanks. Um, yeah, you're talking about coaching bias. I don't know. <laughs> All right, uh, let's thank our speaker.